Welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the early Christian movement and its implications for the church today. I am Andrew Johnson, a pastor at Neartown Church in Houston, Texas. We are joined, as always, by our resident Ephesiologist, Michael, and today we have the distinct joy of being joined by Evan Owens. He is the co-founder of Reboot Recovery and author of Healing What's Hidden. Evan, we are glad to have you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, but before you talk, and I, I let you do all the wonderful things like introducing who you are and why we should love you and uh, join the throng of people who adore you. Michael, why do we have Evan on today? Well, I'm excited about this because, as you know, and I think as some of our listeners, hopefully many of our listeners know, that we have been very interested in issues of social justice. Um, uh, we've written books about it. Our latest book came out, has it been two years now or some time ago? Uh, a year and a half or something like that. year and a half. Um focusing on issues of justice. And uh, we had two wonderful chapters in that book that are dealing with an issue that we rarely talk about in the church, and that's uh, mental health. And uh, we had Kathy Bhatia, who wrote about um, how to address mental health, uh, practically speaking. And uh, then our daughter and uh, a friend of hers, a friend of ours, a friend of the podcast, actually, Brian pod. Salveron, wrote uh, a chapter on anxiety and mental health in the church. And so I'm excited that we've been thinking about these things, talking about them, and uh, wanting really to take this seriously, because we're in a context now, I think that's been exacerbated at some level by COVID, mm -hmm. but um, some might actually have characterized it as a crisis in the church, a mental health crisis. Uh, maybe even in the country. And so uh, we're, we've uh, had the privilege of beginning to develop a relationship with Evan and Reboot Recovery and just have, just have had a wonderful time looking at the material that he and his wife have developed, uh, talking with them about how to make this contextual and other places where people are experiencing trauma at levels that uh, really in some cases are unprecedented. And so I'm I'm happy to have Evan on. Evan, welcome uh, to, to you. Well, I'm very excited to be here, and I'm sure everyone now is psyched to hear me talk about sad mental health topics for the next <laughs> little exactly. bit together. That's uh, people are like, oh man, gotta gotta make sure to not miss this one. Yeah, man, he's, right. he sounds really happy. I wonder how quickly he's going to depress us. Right, right, exactly. Uh, so well, back to the happy things before we jump in with the great questions, because we want to always try to set up our guests to be uh, not just talking heads, but normal people. Evan, uh, tell us three important things that you would love for us to know about you. Okay. Well, um, my wife and I started Reboot together. And so in addition to being married happily for 16 years, we also raised three amazing boys together and we work together. So it's unusual that married couples are together literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week and stay happy together. And so that's a pretty special bond that we feel very blessed to have had that I don't know if everybody should work together. So that's probably the first. That's uh, awesome. Number two, my uh, I am not a doctor or a counselor or a psychologist. So I'm not um, speaking from that perspective. I'm actually speaking from a peer standpoint. Um, and so the way that I approach mental health is maybe a little bit different than diagnosis, prognosis. It's a little bit um, more about uh, functioning through rather than numbing or or eliminating symptoms. And so there's a difference in perspective there a little bit that I think um, people always want to understand kind of what qualifies me. So we talk about that. Mm. And the third thing um, is that uh, in high school, I was a, I grew up in the inner city and uh, went to a, a pretty diverse, actually very diverse high school. And I developed this very strange skill at a young age, which was beatboxing. And mm. so I uh, learned to beatbox for like people who rapped and sang and stuff like that. And so this is my my secret talent. Anytime I'm on a uh, not a podcast, but anytime I'm on like a camp <laughs> right. game with kids, 
that's what they asked me to do is to beatbox, which I'm not going to do on this particular podcast. But oh, I, um, was, I was just hoping that this might be our new physiology intro. No, no I, that's not going to happen. You, you yeah. the pay it for this podcast is not enough for that. But uh, <laughs> at kids camp, we'll do that kind of stuff, and kids will get up. So that's that's a fun thing. So that's that's it. Those are incredible things about yourself, and and now I feel like I have a fuller picture of you. <laughs> so, nice. um, tell us a bit about if if you wouldn't mind, what led you to start Reboot Recovery? What was happening in the ethos in your life? In, in your family's life, in the world around you that said, we've got to take a step towards this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was a, it was a series of steps. It was a lot of little baby steps. Uh, I grew up in a house that was, uh, my dad's a, a veteran of Vietnam, and um, I married a girl who went to go work for the Department of Defense. She was recruited away from Vanderbilt. University Medical Center to go work for the Department of Defense at Fort Campbell, building the first traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress clinic of its kind on a military installation. And um, every day she would come home telling me these these incredible stories of people who were on the brink of suicide, people who were in the darkest places, had visited the darkest places in the world, and who were trying to discover who they were now that their military career were in, was ending. They were trying to discover how to deal with what they had witnessed and what they had seen and what they had participated in. They were trying to deal with the damage that, or the toll that trauma had taken on their relationships and their ability to socially and intimately connect with others. And so uh, my wife just started inviting people over for dinner from our community and really just um, having open-ended conversations. My background was at the time I was the CEO of a software company, software development company. And I had managed enough people to know that one of the best things you can do as a leader is just ask insightful questions and let people talk. And so we just sat around and did that many, many nights a week, uh, had people over most nights. We didn't have any children yet. And this recurring theme kept coming up, um, which was there's three themes that kept coming up. One was that people felt like they were the only ones. Number two is people felt like there was... Um, something deeper than mental health, that there was a soul health issue that no one was mm. talking about. Mm. And number three is, is there was nothing peer to peer in terms of a leadership structure. Everything was top down sort of clinical approach. And so um, we realized, Hey, what if we got everybody together and started having this conversation in a group format? And we did that and we kept doing that. And um, people began to come more and more and more friends invited friends the military invited us onto the military base. And uh, we did that for almost five years, actually longer than five years. We started oh, in wow. technically in 2011 and did it until 2016. Um, and, you know, you learn a lot and your heart gets more and more and more drawn in. If you do something two, three nights a week for five years, you learn a lot, you know, in that period of time. And so um, it became really clear as we started traveling on the weekends to start what we had then by then called reboot recovery. At first it was just called Evan and Jenny's house on Monday nights, which was a terrible brand name. We decided <laughs> um, that's harder to fit on a business card. Well, maybe if we do it like a military acronym though, you know, like it oh, could have, it could have yeah. worked, you know, um, very well but uh, we were traveling every weekend. I was leading groups multiple times a week. By this point we had started building a curriculum. Um, and so we both quit our jobs in 2016 to do this full time, went from dual income, no kids to three kids and no income over a, a short period of time. Um, hey, again, that was not something I recommend for most marriages. Um, yeah. And we just really felt God was saying that there was a lot more Evan and Jenny's out there. There was a lot of people who wanted to do more than play in a golf tournament or run in a 5K or post something on social mm -hmm. media. They actually wanted to be a part of the solution for their friends. And so we, we started off in military. Then in 2018, after the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, we expanded into the first responder world with a new curriculum. And then in 2020, uh, during COVID, released our third program, which is called Trauma Reboot, which is Trauma Healing for Everyone. And that brings us to today. Wow. Wow. What I almost that? feel like I have whiplash. That was incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's been incredible. And it's definitely been a whiplashing kind of experience. It's been um, stretching in every sense of the word stretching in every sense and not painful, just stretching and growing and growth is always, you know, you tear some muscles when you're, mm -hmm. when you're working out and growing and developing depth, I think with the Lord and depth with your faith and 
depth in your relationship and, you know, depth of knowledge, all those things, you know, pain and suffering is, is the, the method of growth. It's the method of discovering more growth and hope. And so, um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Neat. So you started uh, focusing on the military, then first responders, then to uh, the trauma healing for everyone. What are some of the things that you're seeing? What have, what have you learned through that whole process about the impact of trauma um, or even the pervasiveness of trauma? Oh, my goodness. That's a broad. Yeah, I would say um, first is that regardless of the method that your trauma intersected your life, whether it was through the hands of another person, whether it was as an adult, as a child, as, you know, fill in the blank. I've learned that our, the human response to trauma is quite similar, regardless of culture or age or background or method of trauma exposure. And that says something I think really profound about how God designed us and also about our fallen nature. You know, we look at um, our default response to trauma as human beings is usually what we call to deny, cry, numb, and run. These are sort of the four default steps that we as people, when we encounter something that conflicts with the way that God impre- imprinted on our hearts that said, this is the way the world should be. When we experience something that says, wait a minute, something inside of me is saying this is wrong. This is not the way it was intended to be. This this level of pain is not what God had for me. This catalyzes a spiritual question. It catalyzes something we don't really want to address. And so our default response, carnally speaking, is to deny, cry, numb, and run. And I believe the only way to really overcome trauma is really with a supernatural, resilient response, which is to lean into it and say, how is this changing me? What does this tell me about myself? What's this tell me about God? What's this tell me about other people? And then using those three questions to let it inform our worldview, um, hopefully towards growth as opposed towards, you know, more chaos, more pain. Um, so I'd say that has been probably my greatest thing is or greatest learning has just been that we're not all that different from one another, mm. you know, whether you're gay, straight, Muslim, atheist, Christian, white, black, Brown, whatever it is, we're really not all that different when it comes down to how we, when, when crisis trauma, things like that pain enter our life, it's a great equalizer. We suddenly are a lot more alike than we think. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I love the approach that you're taking to lean into trauma and to build resiliency in that. As you look at um, your work around the world, are you seeing what describe some of the trauma that you're seeing in in the prevalence of it? Is it that yeah, we're well, just becoming more aware of it, or is there literally more trauma today than what we've realized? Both. I think yeah. both. Yeah, okay. I think both. For example, let's talk about young people. For example, first, um, there is an element that is very true that says that this generation is sort of the mental health diagnosis happy generation that there is um you know one in three kids you know entering college have already experienced have already taken a daily mood altering medication to be able to deal with the stress in their life for example or the emotions mm-hmm. in their life that's dynamically different than 50 years ago i mean not even in the same world yeah that's not uh, if you ask the average 18 year old to tell me about something traumatic they've experienced they will rattle off five to ten experiences instantly um if i go to my dad and mom who are in their 70s and say tell me about something traumatic they might talk about some of their miscarriages they might talk about his deployment and that'll be about it right and so there's this changing of language we're seeing nationally and and really globally which is terms that used to the, the, the language we use to describe normal human experiences has changed to clinical terminology for example i will ask someone um a young person about a, a test that they have coming up and they'll say i'm just feeling super i have lots of anxiety about this test coming up or i did bad in that test i'm super depressed about it right these are clinical terms these are diagnosable terms. These are treated terms versus an older generation might have said, I'm really sad I messed up on that test or I'm really worried about this test coming up. And that subtle shift, because you see worry, sadness, these are human emotions that God tells us we will all have. Things like anxiety and depression 
are traditionally clinical terms used that are indicate these things are problems that are meant to be avoided. Mm, and so when you shift from the the words we use, use have tremendous impact over how we view the experiences that we're having as human beings, as whether this is an experience that's common to all men, or this is a common, this is an experience that's uniquely um, paralyzing or, or attacking me. And therefore I should flee from it and numb from it and not have to experience it. I should not have to deal with this. And so uh, that is something that is globally happening. At the same time, we also have the most distracted generation of parents ever. So when you look at young people specifically, you have um, they're competing for the attention of their parents through their cell phones. Um, it's the most neglected and abandoned generation for sure that has ever existed um, in terms of parentless households. And then when you look at adults, the rates of reported abuse are higher than ever. The rates of sexual crime against people are higher than ever. The rates of um, uh, suicide and addiction, you know, so suicide, second leading cause of death now, ages 18 to 39 um, and climbing. And so you look at this, um, not just in the military and first responder community, which that data paints an even worse, you know, maybe scarier picture. But I think, you know, when we look at this, there is a thread of goodness that's running throughout it, which is, I believe that it is opening the door for people of faith to re-enter a conversation that they um, were either pushed out of or willfully stepped out of, you know, two decades ago, which is this conversation about mental health and God's role when it comes to our health. Um, and we're no longer feeling this pressure to outsource all of the brokenness to professional clinicians. But I believe that we're stepping back into it and saying, God has something to say about suffering. God has something to say about trauma. He has something to say about mental health. Let's have a conversation. And that's really special. That's really wow. a special time. And I believe perhaps that the greatest evangelical opportunity the kingdom on this earth has seen in generations. Well, I, I love that because, uh, it, it, I mean, that's one of the issues, of course, that we see in culture and that we need to be thinking about how to effectively engage that issue, uh, the trauma, the mental health. And I love that you guys are actually doing that. You're actively uh, yeah. developing resources to help the church to take its place in that conversation uh, in, in really a significant way. Talk about that. And, and here, of course, I'm referring to the Overcome Academy that really is a, a academy to help equip people in the church to yeah. effectively uh, engage in uh, those kinds of conversations. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it like this, generally speaking, the person closest to the problem is the best equipped to solve the problem. This is management structure 101, right? And this is the mistakes that businesses make around the country. I see this. A lot of my friends are CEOs of companies and they have these big boardroom discussions about how to solve some problem. And you know what they oftentimes forget to do is invite anybody who's actually working closest to the problem into the conversation, right? And so right. they come up with the solution. And when they deliver it down the food chain, the person's like, that doesn't solve the problem at all. And it won't work for all these 50 reasons, right? And there's this disconnect. Well, we really start with this premise that the people closest to the problem are often best equipped to respond because mental health crisis, suicidal ideation, things like this, they don't happen in the ER at the hospital. They happen on the front porch or at the baseball field or in the grocery store, right? They happen in this context of their friends and family who are around them in that moment. Natural and flow of life sort of stuff. That's correct. And so in that case, they're more likely to notice a problem and be able to address a problem far quicker than traditional clinical approaches, which won't even be aware there's a problem for potentially ever or days after the problem has emerged. Mm -hmm. And so, and with prevention, suicide prevention specifically, speed is of utmost importance, right? Response time is very important. And so we think about this concept of who are really our first responders when it comes to mental health, when it comes to trauma, when it comes to suicide. The first responders are these people. They're your small group leaders. They're your pastors. They're your friends. They're your family. And if you go back really before about 1970, 1980, um, most of our counseling was done by those people. It was right. done on the front porch, right? It was done over a beer at a restaurant. It was done uh, uh, after church on Sundays at, 
supper. It was done. And we've drifted further and further away from what I refer to as common sense counseling and friendship, which is really sometimes people don't need a counselor. What they really just need is a loving friend who's going to listen and who is who has the indwelling of the counselor, right? Who has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who's able to use that gift to be able to listen well and love well in that moment. And so that's what we really do is we teach small group leaders. So we've got three trauma healing curriculums that people go through, but we also have a training curriculum that you just referred to that's called Overcome Academy, where we train small group leaders, prayer team leaders, lay leaders, pastoral leaders on how to help their churches respond to trauma and mental health in a way that is natural and sustainable and scalable and healthy for everyone involved. And... um it's one of my favorite things to do because each person that I train in that is going to use it. It's just a matter of days, weeks, or months before they have the opportunity when they're like, Oh, what was that thing that I learned? Yeah. Okay. I know what questions to ask now that won't cause harm. I know how to, how to escalate this person to get more professional help if they need to. I know, you know, and I think confident or knowledge breeds confidence in those moments, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're doing with that. And it's, it's, um, been way cool. You said something and I was, you, you stole the question out of my mouth. So if I'm like stepping on Overcome Academy's toes, you just let me know. But what, uh, what's that line? There's that, there's that, uh, squishy line between I, as your friend, uh, for me, I, as a pastor am able to counsel, to help, to encourage, to guide towards health, to listen. But there is that line which says, and we have now reached the part where I say, you need something more than I can give. You, right. you need to get maybe some professional help. There is there is something and someone Absolutely. that you must have to get to health that I can't help you with. Um, how have you all dealt with helping articulate that line for folks? Yeah, I, I think um, when you were a little kid and you had to go get a shot, did your parents say, okay, I'm going to be here in the waiting room. You go and deal with this super painful experience. You go get this shot by yourself with the doctors. And if you need me, I'm going to be out in the car. Take a look. Or did your parents say, you know what? I don't know how to give you the shot. I'm not a doctor, but I'm going to go back to the waiting room with you. I'm going to go into the medical room with you. I'll be right there behind the glass watching, making sure you're okay. I'm not leaving your side. Probably the second. But when we get to adults, especially in the church, we've gotten all too comfortable handing off and outsourcing the care mm -hmm. to the broken. And so rather than saying, well, here's the line, and now we just need to make a handoff, aka my hands are clean, come back to me if you need me, what if would it look like if we joined them? What if we were incarnational? What if we were able to say, hey, yeah, you're going to go get clinical care. I'm going to drive you there. I'm going to be there to pick you up after your first appointment. I want to check in with you. Let's keep meeting every week to talk about it. Let's combine the spiritual with the mental health, which I'm not sure, are, you know, at war. I don't think they are. I think that yeah. they're collaborative. What if we can, what if we were, were joiners as opposed to delegators? And I think that that's the great, it's very hard. And I get that it's very hard from a time commitment standpoint. I, I more than maybe most could understand the hardship of having to walk a lot of people through it. I, I really do understand <laughs> it. But on the flip side, um, like I said, I, I think that there's something that happens when a person comes to the lighthouse for help and the lighthouse says, sorry, I, I'm not really able to help you go to another, go to a different place. Um, and I, and I see that's the way the majority of churches, I think operating from a place of fear mm -hmm. in many cases is, you know, they were told in the eighties, you know, Hey, if somebody comes to you and they're suicidal, don't say anything, you're going to say the wrong things and they're going to end up hurting themselves. And so pass it to us. We'll take it from here. Well, let's look at how that's gone. I mean, over the past 25 years, suicide has increased every single year nationally, except for two. Hmm. So at hmm. some point as business people, we have to look at the problem and say, hmm, at what point do we say, hey, this plan hasn't worked? Let's let's try to re-enter the conversation. Let's try to come alongside the mental health professionals. Um, so I'd say that, and that's where, I, so it's not as much of a line as it is a continuation of collaboration with mental health providers. Does that make sense how I'm answering the question? It doesn't, I don't think it it's does. like a, here's our domain and here's their domain. 
Yeah. No, it's it's helpful and hilariously I'm listening and I feel, you know, just immediately condemned. So I appreciate that, Evan. That's my heart <laughs> really is condemnation. It's not so much conviction. It's more just guilt and shame and regret. That's really what I'm hoping to um, make people feel on the call. You today. actually are walking around with a finger pointing and and it's just constantly saying you suck. And then you're I do have a large somebody. foam finger right beside me that just says it's all your fault. Would yeah, you like and you grab? wait until somebody just comes in view and it's like, oh, it's your turn now. <laughs> That's uh, right. It's all your fault. Um, I find that's really good with trauma survivors. It's all your fault. You oh, know, I find that's really the best. Um, we were waiting for somebody to really articulate that. Evan, you have arrived. Thank you. Yeah, that's what we need. A little uh, more judgment, a uh, little less grace. That's definitely what we need for if we've gone through trauma. That's what we need. <laughs> Michael, if you haven't picked up on this, even though this is my first time meeting with Evan, I can I can already see we're we're kin. We are close of comic <laughs> nature, and so uh, apologies to our listeners. Um, comic or sarcastic? One hey, of the two. Well, I'm just hopeful that none of my comments that I just made were taken out of context as a soundbite because that <laughs> because would ruin my sarcasm. entire career. Uh, you know. So let me and let me just say one other quick thing on a serious note, yeah. which is um, one of the 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 things that I'm finding most fascinating is in the faith world. There is this, okay, I'll make it short. Uh, the clinical world is figuring out that peer-based support is the future of mental health care. That's the clinical community. I'm, I go to a lot of conferences. I speak at these conferences, and here's what they're finding. They're finding, one, there's not enough clinicians to meet the current mm -hmm. demand. Mm -hmm. And number two, they've realized that clinicians can't do the totality of the long-term care, especially the aftercare, which is after those eight right. sessions, then what? So they've realized this versus for the past 20 years, they've laughed off peers. They've laughed off pastors. They've laughed off small group leaders. They've laughed off people and basically been like, you're not equipped. Let us take it. And now they've evolved just as they're evolving back to this. The church is finally saying, you know what we need to do? We need to embrace mental health and start working with more clinicians. So it's like this lag effect yeah, where I'm like, no, 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 actually life. do, do what, do, do what you do. Embold your small group leaders. Like you are the best possible answer to the future of mental health care which is peer-based support and community like do what you do but just do it a little bit more informed um which is not a big leap versus having to build an entire counseling center and hire staff and all these things you don't have to do that like if you don't have the money that's okay just work with somebody who does and then you do what you do and um i think that there's something really really cool that's that i'm seeing happening which is so I hear this a lot when I go to Christian conferences. It's it's okay to have Jesus and a therapist. I see t-shirts that say that, you know, it's mm -hmm. okay to have G Jesus plus therapy is like what Jackie, um, Jackie Hope, Perry. an author that I follow. Okay. And that's all true. And that's all wonderful. As long as it is not a substitute for us building genuine community. And I think about, is it a tragedy that the majority of adults feel like they need to go to a counselor to finally find someone who would truly listen to them. Mm -hmm. How did we get here to where we're not interruptible? We're so busy that when somebody starts laying heavy things at our feet, most of us are like, well, that's a bummer, man. Like you should go see, see a professional talk about that. I don't have the energy to absorb your crap. Mm -hmm. How did we get here? And I think that's the shame is most of us have started hiring people who will become our surrogate best friends who will listen to us. Mm -hmm. And I hear that burning out my Dang. friends who are clinicians, people who my clinicians privately tell me some people don't want to get better because all they really want is the attention that they get from being sick. They just wow. need to remain sick or else they have no friends. And wow. we have to do a better job as the church. I think who better than us, if not us, then who mm. to show sacrificial incarnational love? Like we have the secret now, I'm not saying that that's going to work for mental health without professionals. I'm not saying that. I'm not anti-professionals or medication or any of that thing. But they can't be your best friend. They have 800 clients. They don't have that capacity. No. And there's not enough of them. And they're all burned right. out. And they're all working overtime as it is. Um, and that's where I think I'm feeling something really cool happening. They are welcoming us in like never before. Man, I mean, they are so excited about what we're doing. And they are coming alongside of us, and they are just hungry for our approach, and we're hungry to unburden them. I mean, it's just this beautiful new era that we've entered into in the past three or four years. 
Um, Evan, you're, you're, you're talking about something that I, I feel is a little on the ironic and hilarious side. Um, at once, we have become a culture where we go for that quick fix, the, you know, take the medicine that's going to help you get over this hump, um, do the thing that is the fastest route to get to the end that you want. And so in a funny yes. way, uh, Jesus plus therapy is good. What therapy exists as is just a person shaped pill, right? Like I, I need to go to this counselor. I need to, this is my quick fix. I will go to this counselor. I will have this session and I will get this fixed. And then now that I've done that, I can move on. I can move back to right. health. The scripture has long taught us that discipleship is a long game. It right. is slow. It is Jesus working on our hearts that that ever becoming more and more like the image that God has both given us and growing in Christ likeness is not a a 10 step course. It is yeah. not fast. And so why, why, right. why would we look at mental health and the rest of our life and expect it to operate in a different way than how God has designed us to grow and move towards health. Right. And that's really what differentiates reboot from traditional approaches is our primary interest is not the removal of symptoms. You know, take heart. I've overcome the world. You will have trouble. So we believe the symptoms will often come and go. Um, but what doesn't necessarily come and go is hope and joy in spite of those trials, in spite of those symptoms that can be permanent. And that's a fundamental difference. Um, and, you know, something as you were talking that I've never, ever said before that I just thought about this idea of the gift of presence, you know, that story when Jesus um, leaves to go pray and he comes back and his disciples are asleep and he gets so mad. It just kind of, this revelation just hit me that perhaps one of the reasons he was so upset was because he felt alone and abandoned. And he said, I just want you to be with me. Like, I just want you to carry some of this burden with me right now. Like just be in my life, just be present, be available. Even if you don't say anything, just when I come back, be awake, be available. I wonder if that was a piece of that story. I don't know. I'm not the theologian on the yeah. call, but well, I mean, be the, be the, uh, those few verses in Job, just be the silent friends that sit and mourn and don't say anything for days at a time. Be those right. version of Job's friends, not the later version of Job's friends, which right, 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 right. Uh, that's right. But be the that's silent right. present. Yeah. And I found also when you ask people questions, you know, I've always found that the missing ingredient most people overlook is curiosity. If you're actually curious to understand how someone was hurt, what hurt them, how they're processing it, if you approach it with genuine curiosity and grace, you'll never go wrong. You can't go wrong. You can't, if you have genuine curiosity and grace. Now, if you start leading with advice, right? Certainly with that stuff, you can go wrong really, really, really quickly. But that's the reason why a bunch of military dudes back in 2011 started opening up to me is because I was genuinely curious to understand what they had been through. And nobody else was genuinely curious on a Tuesday night while having dinner, taking time away from their family when they could have been gone and play tennis or golf or whatever people do. I don't do any of those things, but you know, <laughs> um, this is what I do for fun is talk about trauma and suicide all day long. So, uh, hey. you know, some type of self abuse situation there. Um, but I think that's what they really responded to, you know? Um, and then we always say this about trauma and then I'll shut up is we always say trauma is our personal intersection with the brokenness of the world. And that recovery is our personal intersection with the redemptive heart of God. And I really think that that is what they were drawn to was a person and people who were genuinely curious who loved them for no other reason than they loved them. There was no agenda. There was no billing. There was no insurance involved. We just loved them. And I think through us, they also reconnected with the redemptive heart of God. And all of a sudden it was like their perspective on what they experienced shifted. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. You and Jenny wrote a book not too long ago, uh, Healing What's Hidden. Tell us a little bit about that. It's a book. It's called Healing What's Hidden, and we wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> there are words. There is there are words. There are many pages. Uh, Unless no, you have yeah. an ebook format. Yes. So the short version is um, I really, really, really put off writing a book. And here's why. 
I am around a lot of friends. So if I didn't condemn you yet and you're listening, you're going to feel super condemned by this because we've all done this. Someone is drowning. We see them flailing, kicking, and screaming, and we throw them a book called Learn How to Swim, and we walk away. Mm -hmm. This is the way we use books. We use books to outsource relationships, again, to avoid having to actually go there. Uh, um, for the and listener, we do it because I'm rather than it. us absorbing the content and then sharing the content, we just say, they're going to say it better than me. Read it for yourself. And that's kind of true. But again, that's a little bit like you go back there and do the hard work. I'm going to be over here on the dock with my beach umbrella and, you know, call me if you need anything. Um, and so I just was like, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be like, here's a book. Best of luck to you. You're like, you know, I don't want to be that guy. But um, the the way that they really got me was through the lens of re turning back to the content that they had learned through our other programs and refreshing their memory when future things happen. And so we approached several publishers. We said, we have this idea to write this book on a practical guide to overcoming trauma and building it off of the science that we've done research on to learn about our unique approach. And we've served over 20,000 people and here's all the data. Here's all the science. Here's all the research. We want to write a book that's clinically informed, but also deeply spiritual that really follows people through this process that now they could go and revisit. And so we wrote the book to be uh, like 60 micro chapters actually. And so it's meant to be read once and referenced often. And right. um, the response to the book has been, um, so much better than I could, than I ever wanted it to be. Um, it led to us being able to go on tour with this guy named Brandon Lake, who's like a big Christian recording artist. And um, we got to speak at his events every night around the country. And um, we got to be on all these amazing podcasts like this one. And, um, you know, nobody gets rich writing books unless you, you know, are like a celebrity to begin with pretty much. Right. And, um, I won't be, and I'm not a celebrity. So, um, I just think the ministry of it's been, been cooler than I thought. I I'm a little shamed that I put it off so long. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, they can check it out on Amazon or any of those other places healing what's hidden. And it's actually a really good book. Like I, I reread it parts of it recently and I was like, Oh, wow, that's a really good point. And I forgot that we wrote the point. So yeah. that was, kind of a book. I was like, Who Oh, wow. You know? Who said I said that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, I said that jokingly, but there was some truth. Like I read through, I was like, this is so good. You know, I was like, man, I should, I wish I sounded like that all the time, you know, someone who had edited me and made me sound cooler than I actually am. Um, oh, that's so. great. Well, that's great. Well, hey, I have one other question because I know this is on the minds of a lot of people today, especially parents. Parents are often that first line, aren't they, with their children? Almost They're, always. What What's the advice here, Evan? How can you help parents think about issues that their children might be wrestling with? Yeah, yeah. Um, cupfuls of grace, pinches of of truth initially mm -hmm. would be my advice. Um, you know, and I think um, oftentimes as, as parents, <clears throat> we, I feel the need to solve and tell um, what they should be feeling and doing. And I have found that when I lead with grace first, then I get to the thing that's behind the thing that's actually fueling the thing that they're talking to me about. Um, so that would be the first one is usually the thing that a young person tells you is the thing. They're not even aware. That's not really the thing. There's a thing deeper than that, right. that they're not even aware yet. And if I lead with grace and ask open into questions, sometimes they self discover in real time. Holy crap. That's the thing. Um, so that's number one. Number two is you can go on Google and type in like list of feeling words, something that it sounds super cheesy, but sometimes when your kids say like, I'm just super mad or I'm bummed out, it's because they, you know, we as human beings, we really suck pretty bad at articulating the exact feelings that we're feeling. And so we, we communicate what we're feeling and we hope that people will kind of hunt and peck and be able to figure out what we're actually feeling. But sometimes I'll say, you know, I hear you saying that you're upset what are you actually feeling? And, and they'll be like, I don't know, just mad. And I'm like, no. And so then I'll pull up a list of words and we'll be like, let's talk through which one of these. And it might be, they feel rejected. They might mm -hmm. feel overlooked. Mm -hmm. They might feel discarded. They might feel betrayed. They might feel, and now you start to get to what's the real root, 
not what's the manifesting uh, emotion, but what's the actual um, root. And the third thing is, is I think it starts really young. I have a friend of mine. Um, she put this on social media probably six years ago, and it's it's never left me. She said that the other day her kid came home and he was talking to her about Minecraft. He's a eight year old boy. And she said, and he rambled on about Minecraft and she goes, I couldn't care less about Minecraft. I don't even hardly know what's going on in Minecraft. And he talked about it for like hours. On yes. End. I'm familiar. Go on. Okay. And she said, but, and she says, and parents, she said, listen, and she said, just listen and entertain and pretend that you're really interested. She goes, today it's Minecraft. Tomorrow will be something that you wish you would have really listened to. And they're picking up today. Does mom and dad care about what I care about? So when we discard and we say, I don't want to hear any more about Minecraft. I'm not interested in what you're interested. In. I don't really care to hear your stuff. We're sending a very loud message that their world's not important to us. And so when they get into the real things, they have a history lesson to say, well, they didn't care about that. They're not going to care about this either. Hmm. And that is the greatest advice I've ever received as a parent is hmm. just to listen and to abide with our children. Presence. Goodness. Right. Presence. I wow. do want to encourage, uh, uh, based on what Evan had said. Now, let me tell you what I have and not, I will hide what I do. Right. So right. what we have is one of those really helpful little emotion pillows that have all of the the words and and so like the center of the circle is like the bigger emotions and then the next layer uh is a further description of that emotion and then you go out another layer oh, cool. still, and uh so that little emotion pillow has helped us and our family uh with the minions That's that good. we have all three of them um, just saying, hey, I can see this is what you're feeling. So how are you feeling? Okay, but it's not that maybe is there something even a little bit deeper? So we actually have used that. Um, and I really want to encourage it. Um, I actually was about to like grab it and show the camera, but it's my Spider-Man pillow behind me. And it's not that pillow that's in another room. Um, uh -huh. But I, I say this is what we have. And I'm hearing you talk, Evan, and just realizing there have been so many more opportunities that I, I should have been resourcing that and with my kids and listening. And, you know, again, we have already established that I feel condemned. And so you just keep giving more <laughs> advice that's real, helping me realize that I am the type that leads with the book. I am the type that leads with advice. Uh, and there is so much more that I need to do by way of leading with grace and leading with yeah. listening. And that's how we're trained, though. I mean, that's what... Yeah. That's the way people did us. And that's mm. the way we do people. It just trickles down, you know? So it's, it's, um, it's taken me 15 years to realize some of my tendencies and us as humans tendencies, you know, and, and also hearing again, when you sit across from people for 15 years, 12 years and listen to them, they'll say things like, and they just gave me another book. And the last thing I could handle was another book, you know? And so it's like, file that away. So it's, I always say like, I'm not really coming up with stuff. I'm just regurgitating in maybe a clearer sense what people mm -hmm. tell me they've experienced. Right. You know, I'm more like an organizer of their, like a, a aggregator and a cultivator of their input. Not so much mm -hmm. a, I don't have to have many of my original ideas. I just have to package what they have told me over the years. Right. And it makes you look brilliant. So well done. And that's actually uh, my primary goal. Yes. Is to look brilliant. <laughs> that's, I really care about that. That's, you know, um, when you have a face like this, you better be smart. Evan, I, I have a very similar feeling that I look for the best coattails to ride and then I jump on them. So it looks like I'm smart, but I'm pointing to other smart people. Michael, go. thank you very much for a physiology. So well, now uh, I know why I feel so tired. I've been dragging your bro. Self around. <laughs> you don't even know the half of it. You don't even know the half of it. So oh. Evan, in, in similar fashion, I think Michael and we as a physiology have seen some really wise coattails to jump on or partner with. So I want to kind of kick it to Michael and Evan. How have we as a physiology masterclasses come alongside Reboot Recovery? Well, I think it's the other way around. Reboot Recovery has come alongside of us and provided one of their resources, the Overcome Academy. And uh, we're just so grateful for that. Uh, and so it's on our uh, Physiology Masterclasses website. It's free. And we want to encourage people to get involved in learning more about mm. 
trauma and uh, and how they can actually practice being in the presence of people who are experiencing some difficult things and walk with them through it. So I've I've been excited about that. Looking forward to about uh, about how we're going to continue and develop our relationship as we think about traumatic events around the world. I mean, we're we're living in a a world that is increasingly uh, hostile to Christianity. Um, and so we're excited about being able to think with brothers and sisters in different places about how we might be able to come alongside of them and provide some resources and work together to develop those resources. So, so this is, this has been a, a, a fun relationship to be a part of. Uh, I've enjoyed getting to know Evan just briefly, ever so briefly, but Jess as well. And yeah. uh, of course, Lori has been involved in this, my wife and and uh, we're excited to see where God's going to take this. This is yeah. so great. Evan, thank, thank you, you very much for um, coming alongside us, allowing us to be another platform to kind of keep pointing towards health. And um, I almost asked it earlier, but it just it just seems wonderful to me. This is not a we have to choose between the good news about Jesus or mental health. These are not opposing forces. Um, this is moving in the same direction of, right. of healing and wholeness and uh, in the name of Christ coming alongside others to see them. Um, That's exactly restored. it. So, Evan, thank you for your time. Thank you for your words of wisdom. Uh, if somebody wants to get at you, uh, contact you, pursue, um, seeing what Reboot Recovery has, where can they find you? Yeah, just go website rebootrecovery.com or any socials pretty much just reboot recovery um and if they want to follow jenny and i specifically i think it's uh i think it's evan and jenny owens like full typed out evan and jenny owens we're not super active on social so you can i think we have like six followers it's mainly our mm. parents but uh but you can our goal is to there. get it to 12 yeah yeah we're gonna get there guys but yeah seriously go to reboot recovery and uh, if you're interested in bringing reboot to your church or your community um, we are looking for leaders constantly and you're not alone there's about 1200 others of you around the world leading every week and we give you all the coaching and systems and head over reboot recovery click lead a course and, and we can talk to you about it that's fantastic well evan thank you so much for joining us michael thank you for helping um, bring about this possibility that we can broadcast it to others uh, if you would like more information, please go to masterclasses.ephesiology.com. Uh, look into the Overcome Academy and see how God might actually work to continue you and your growth towards Him and health, and how you can um, help others with that. So for Evan, for Michael and myself, thank you for joining us on the Ephesiology Podcast. <laughs>